title today, today's sermon, The Anatomy of Perpetual Victimhood. And all of us have seen this, we, we've been a part of it. It's just somebody that gets in a life situation and they get stuck. You might be in that right now where you're just, you're in a stuck situation. You don't feel like you get out of it. We see it systemically across our culture. Uh, but before I get into the sermon, man, I got to do a little disclaimer if you're visiting with us today or if you're one of our guests. Uh, and you may not have heard my story, uh, but I, 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 got, I got to state this as I'm coming into this. Otherwise, people will wonder what my perspective is, okay? Because I, I, I do have some education. Uh, I've got an honorary doctorate for like things for ministry I've done over 20 years at college, recognize that, but I also have a doctorate in education and a PhD. And when I talk about the education and the purpose of it, a lot of times people can think I'm coming at it kind of from an elitist position, and I'm not saying that at all. It's more important that you understand the background that I came from is uh, I was, uh, my mom brought me home from the hospital to a house that had no running water, literally had an outhouse. Thank God it was in August and I was out there before winter came. I never had to go to the outhouse in the winter. I will say that, thank God. Uh, but very humble beginnings that, that what I came out of as a family born to a single mom. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more. But what I'm about to share kind of up front near the beginning, I think will hit people's ears differently if they realize that I, I came from a family where a lot of people were born out of wedlock, where there were people in and out of prison, uh, where there were people that struggled with uh, a, a lot of dysfunction, alcoholism, drug abuse, things like that. that. That's the background I came from. I personally used to sell drugs. My mom probably didn't even know that until I said it just now. Uh, I, I probably is, there's one other guy, his best friend, his brother is the biggest drug dealer in town, and I got into that for a little while. So I, I say that not as a badge of honor, but just let you know that if you are in a dysfunctional background, like I'm there with you, I've lived that with you, I know what that looks like, okay? All right, so uh, when we talk about perpetual victimhood, I, I want to share this right up front, that one of the reasons Jesus came was not only to save us from our sins, but to free people from the victimhood mentality that a lot of people live in throughout this whole, their whole life. So what, what I mean by that is, I think a lot of people will end up in heaven someday because they believe in Jesus Christ, but they didn't learn the life skill necessary to live the abundant life on this earth. And Jesus wants you to have both of those. When he saves you, when he comes into your life, he's not just coming into your life so that you can have a good life in eternity. He wants you to start having a healthy, functional um, a, a life where you can contribute to other people's good health, okay? Right from the beginning of the ministry, I want you to see what Jesus says. He's in church, and they hand him the scroll. All the books of the Bible were in scrolls. So they hand him the scroll, which is Isaiah. And he unrolls it, and he goes to Isaiah 61, and this is what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's the word for the gospel there. He has sent me to proclaim liberty. So not only is he preaching the gospel, but watch this. He sent me to proclaim liberty, that is freedom to captives and recovery of sight to the blind. I think that it's not only uh, literal, but it's also metaphorical. It's both. He healed blind people, but he also released them from spiritual blindness. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, not just those who are oppressed by sin, but people who are oppressed by the systemic failures of our society as a whole. An example of this was with the turning of the water and the wine. Now, we, we, I did that sermon a couple weeks ago. If you weren't here, forgive me, but I'm going to go back and just summarize that briefly, okay? Jesus is at this wedding, and they run out of wine. Now, man, if I never hear another preacher say something to the effect of Jesus was for the party and nobody's not going to party where Jesus is and this was some of that, that I, I don't want to say it had nothing to do with it but it had almost nothing to do with it the problem when they ran out of wine in that society what they would do is they didn't have good drinking water and so they needed some alcohol some of the alcoholic content to put into the to the, the drinking water there, they would water it down, like three parts water, one part wine. 
Nobody would drink, unless you're really filthy rich, nobody drank just straight wine back then. They would put it into the water so that people could have it and not give them uh, spread disease. So they wouldn't have dysentery, so they wouldn't have diarrhea. And some people would even die from food and waterborne illnesses, okay? I'll, I'll give you an example of this. One of the people who was in the first service told me about this. While we were on uh, our trip this time last year in Greece, we were in Corinth, and we were talking about the importance of forgiving one another. And the Lord, it wasn't my plan to necessarily do that there, but the Lord just put it on my heart. We got to do this today. And I will say, after that service, I had a number of people, I even saw somebody post yesterday about how that communion service we had at Corinth was just incredibly spiritually moving what happened that day. I'll never forget us sharing communion there at Corinth. What we didn't know while we were there at Corinth is that one of our members had COVID. I didn't know that. And because it was kind of an impromptu thing, we all passed one chalice around the old Catholic way, okay? So, uh, and we were going to share it. But, but here's the deal. This is the saving grace of God, and I know this is going to shake the foundations of the Baptist church. I went to the local store. They didn't have any grape juice. And so I had a choice, either not do communion, which I was convinced God wanted me to do that, or do it with wine, okay? So forgive me, maybe the elders didn't. I even went to a couple of our elders on the trip and got permission to do this. I said, we're going to have wine, that, uh, we're going we're, we're to do just a sip of wine today in this one chalice. What I didn't know is that alcohol in that chalice is what saved us all from getting COVID that day, Right? So some of you are thinking, well, let's do that all the time. No, we've got choices. We don't share a cup here, okay? So I, I, I share that to say, if it, just back then where they would share utensils, it was good to have a little bit of alcohol in the things. So I, I share that to say in this story, and I explained it a couple weeks ago. The fact that they ran out of wine at that wedding, can you imagine uh, what it would have been like if you had been, that young guy was probably 21 years old, and the girl was probably 13, 14, at oldest, probably 15 years old, okay? The fact that they ran out of wine at that wedding, and people could have gotten sick and even died on that trip, was that those kids' fault? Was it the fault of the kids? No. But the rest of their lives, can you imagine, if Jesus wouldn't have turned that water into wine, and they would have just had to go on straight water from the well, okay, that they had there in Cana, what would that wedding have looked like that evening? I'm just being honest with you. I need you to track with me here. I need you to get this story. What would that wedding have looked like? About 30 minutes after they drank that contaminated water without any wine in it, people would have been running to the woods. They wouldn't have had enough outhouses there to contain all the things that weren't going to be contained in anybody's bodies any longer. People would have gotten sick. Some people might have died, all right? Now, can you imagine, as you're going to the woods and you got the squirts, okay? I know, you all know what I'm talking about, right? As you're squatting over the rock there, what are you going to be thinking as you see everybody else squatting over rocks here locally? What are your feelings going to be toward the parents of the bride and the groom? Okay? They're not going to be kind feelings toward them at all, are they? You're not going to be happy with them. And so, can you imagine future generations when that young guy and girl, the rest of their lives, when they go to family reunion, as long as nobody died from it, every holiday from that point forward, every Hanukkah, every Passover, whatever, People are going to see them for the rest of their lives and associate that young man and young woman. Yeah, I was there on your wedding day. We all got the runs because you ran out of wine, right? It wasn't because of a party Jesus did that miracle. It was for their health. But that all said, let's put two and two together here. A lot of times you read these Bible stories, you don't even see the backstory behind it. In order for them, they're hosting people for a week. And they ran out of wine midweek. And you know if we run out of wine, it's not just that the party is over. Some people's lives may be over. Are y'all tracking with me so far? In what situation? We just got a couple here, just got married a couple weeks ago. Can y'all imagine, okay, 
at y'all's wedding if you ran out of all food or if the food would have had, if everyone would have gotten food poisoning. What would you have thought about that, Emma? You just got married there a couple weekends, right? What if everybody would have gotten food poisoning at your wedding? Would that have been your fault? Did you have anything to do with the food preparation? Did you make the food? No, it wasn't on you. But the rest of the life, people would have made fun of you and Joseph because they all got food poisoning at the wedding, right? And that would have been hung on you. But what if you just would have run out and people would have been there for a week starving or been sick? We're stopping along, driving along the mountain. Stop. I got to run to the woods. And, you know, they would have made fun of you too for the rest of your lives. It would have been humiliating. Now, now track this. Don't miss this. It's important. If you've got guests coming in from out of town and you run out of wine knowing not just that the party is going to be over, that it's going to be a major health crisis, what is the only context by which something like that could happen? Now, we got late, out late from the last service because people just stared at me like you're staring at me now. And I'll keep you here to 1230 if I have to, okay? I've got to get you to understand what Jesus is doing here, okay? What would have to happen if you knew people's lives were on the line? What, what's the context in which you might run out of wine? In your mind, if you're planning that wedding, okay, you, you two hear the feathers. If you're planning that wedding, what's the one thing if you're planning a wedding and people are with you for a week, what's the one thing you cannot run out of? Not food. Not water. They've got to have wine. If you don't have the wine, people are going to get sick. They're going to drink water, but if you don't put the wine in it, they're going to get sick and they're going to get the runs or maybe even die. Do you follow? So, Tiffany, when you're planning your daughter's wedding, the number one thing you got to make sure you got a weak supply of is what? Wine. And if people show up to your wedding and they don't have wine, what does that say about you and Craig? Either you don't care. So, like in first service, they said, well, they must have been really poor. Here's the deal. If you're really poor, you still, like, I guess I'm poor, but everybody can just get sick and die. That's not what you're going to say. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? If you're that poor, you'll just do what? If you don't have enough, if you're that poor that you don't have enough to feed 200 people, then what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to pare down the invitation list. Do you see? But if you invite 200 people knowing you don't have enough wine, what's the problem? You're stupid. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? <laughs> Just say it. You are ignorant. You can't do math, Tiffany. Do you understand? You went into this thinking, I've done the math. This much alcohol should take care of these many people's drinks for a week. You messed it up. You blew it. Do y'all get that? It's simple math. You can't do division and multiplication. What does it tell you about this young bride and groom's family? They weren't just poor. They were also what? Undereducated. This would never, ever happen. And so when Mary says to Jesus, you got to do something, he's like, man, not my monkey, not my circus mom. I don't need to come out right now. People don't need to know I'm the Messiah right now. And she's like, Jesus, if you don't do something, this poor guy, poor guy and girl, the rest of their life are going to be labeled because they are a part of this completely dysfunctional, ignorant family. Do you see the shame in that? Nobody wants that on their kids. No kids want that on them at their own wedding. And so what, this is something that I've discovered over time. And a lot of people don't, when they read this story, they don't recognize what happened there. This was a total, you just really messed it up. There's a lot of words you could say that would be completely improper here, all right? So it's just, this was a total screw up, this whole wedding situation. And this is what I have found over the years, especially growing up in Appalachia. Listen. These poor people, what Jesus recognized was this. They didn't have the personal, educational, or planning capacity or the resources to ensure the health of their guests. 
And that's part of the poor slash not poor formula. Did you know that? It's not just that what you were born into. It's the dysfunctional background that people have that won't allow them to get out of the pit they were born into. It's not just that they don't have the resources. It's they don't have the educational background, the personal discipline, or the professional capacity to schedule their days, to do the math, to maintain a budget. This is to, to organize wealth. And that's the thing like I, I shared a few weeks ago about how the Jews, their whole lives, they save up so people can come. Like this is something you wouldn't see happen with Jewish families because it doesn't matter where you go in the world, if you find the banking industry, no matter where you go in the world, who's going to be heavily involved in the banking industry? What race of people are going to be in there? It's not just stereotypes, it's fact. The Jews. You don't see a bunch of Jews out on the side. Have you ever been walking down the street and there's a Jew homeless, please give me money? Have you ever seen a guy with a kippah out there begging for food? Have you ever seen a family with generations? Are, are y'all tracking what I'm saying? There are things in the Bible, there are rules that the Bible gives us to follow that will pull us out of generational dysfunction. God gave them these rules so that the families could prosper, so that they could do well. And whenever you see families in Jewish society that weren't doing well, it's because of a system that was oppressing them, not following what the Bible said to do. This is another example. Uh, like, uh, how many of you, and it, this isn't class, or I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or anything like that, but I'm just saying in general rule, I don't think this should be embarrassing. But how many of you graduated at one point in your life with a bachelor's degree from some college somewhere? Raise your hand if you ever graduated with a bachelor's degree. Leave your hands up. Okay. How many of you, get ready to put them down when I say, but leave them up until I say otherwise. How many of you, whatever your major was when you were in college, you could not do the job you do today if you would not have learned what you learned in your undergraduate degree. You do, would not be able to do it. Leave your hands up if it was impossible for you to do without that degree. Leave your hands up. Did, did you know that? Two-thirds of the hands in here went down. Okay, now the rest of you can put them down. There's a reason I share that. Getting a college degree doesn't prove that you're smart. People with college degrees aren't any smarter than people without college degrees. Did you know that? It doesn't prove anything other than, this is why I look for a college degree. Don't have to have it, but this is why I look for it. It shows me that people can follow uh, this person that I don't know if I'm just getting a resume and I don't know them from anybody. It shows me if they've got a college degree that they at least know how to have basic follow instruction skills. They can get a syllabus and turn things in in time. This is one of the biggest things that separates the poor and the generationally dysfunctional from those who can function well is they know how to keep a calendar. They can sit down and plan out 50 hours of work for the week. They've got their whole schedule out to where they're going to work. They know they can organize. And this is what I would say to parents. One of the number one gifts you can give to your children is teaching them how to organize their time, which the Bible says to do. Plan it out at least in 15-minute increments. This is how, like, that something when I first came to work, a lot of times people be standing around the water cooler and talking like that. We don't do that down here. I killed it. We don't stand around at Xerox or whatever. If you want an appointment with me, I will sit around and talk with you, but set an appointment with me. I don't just sit around and hope somebody will come and talk to me. I am planning out my week. Do y'all follow that? And that's something that college forces you to learn how to do is how to plan out your week. That's why I also look for athletes and people that are involved in a lot of extracurricular activities is because if someone was an athlete in high school or especially in college, it shows me that not only could they follow what a syllabus said and turn those things in, but they also had to learn how to manage their time so they could give 15, 20 hours a week toward their sport, toward their extracurricular activities, and do the things that everybody else can do. That is a life skill. Show me someone, you want to show me somebody's success? Are they following a budget? And do they keep a well-disciplined calendar? 
And most people who won't plan out their week a week in advance, here's my 50 hours that I'm going to be putting in, they're not going to be successful in life if they can't budget and they can't calendar their time. They just won't do it. It's a generational curse. Listen, people don't drop out of school because they're not smart enough. It's not that. It's because they're not disciplined enough to make the decisions they need to make for long-term success. And for many people, I would say most people in our world, the short-term urgent problems of the day or the immediate desire for fleshly satisfaction outweigh their desire to have overall health, wealth, and prosperity and to pass that down to their kids. Case in point. Here's another case, especially where I grew up. There are people living in houses where the roofs are falling in, but by golly, the dad has that eight or $900, $70,000 truck payment sitting out in the driveway. You got money for that, but you can't tithe. You got money for that big pickup truck you just got to have, but you can't send your kid to this camp. You get, I just see it over and over. It's cultural oppression. You think you got to have that to be respected by your peers. How many Jews are running around driving pickup trucks? Do you follow what I'm saying? How many of them run around saying, I got to have a bass boat? Now, let me say, th- let me say this. I am for bass boats, okay, if you can afford it. I caught the biggest striper I ever caught in my life, a seven and a half pound striper this week, biggest striper I ever caught. And I wouldn't have caught that if I didn't have a member of the church take me on his bass boat, okay? So I'm happy to have that, but I'm spending a lot of time on this because we don't talk about enough about this in church. There are a lot of people who are constant in economic victimhood because they don't learn the life skills that the Bible teaches us to follow in order to have prosperity. And a lot of times, especially in the white mainline denomination church, the pendulum, because of the Joel Osteens of the world and the health, wealth, and prosperity, Creflo Dollar got to have his jet flying all over everywhere. Because of the abusive we've, abuses we've seen in the health, wealth, prosperity movement, saying that if anything bad ever happens to you, it's because you're sinful. Because of that, the pendulum has swung too far the other direction that we don't want to tell people that Jesus does want to prosper your family. He does want you to have success in life. He does want you to be at the top of your fields. He does want our children to excel. It's just not the number one sign of spiritual maturity. Do y'all follow with me so far? So what does Jesus do here? He does the bailout of the parents, probably Mary's friends, so that the kids getting married don't have to start out in generational dysfunctional shame. And oftentimes in life, my friends, listen, we start out in social shame because of the choices that our parents made. But what I'm here to declare to everyone here in this room is that Jesus is saying to all of us, you don't have to continue in that path. You don't have to stay in that pit, not emotionally, not economically, not spiritually. Do y'all follow with me so far? You can get out. So next, what do we see? Jesus goes into the temple. He starts clearing out the temple. Remember, he's there to set the captives free, to release the oppressed. Why did we discuss that Jesus cleansed out the temple? Why did he clean out the temple? Because they were oppressing what group of people? Who did he shout out when he was in there? He shouted at the people selling doves, and those were the ones that sold the sacrifices to the poor among them. Jesus understood The only hope these people who are in generational poverty have is that they get involved in a church, or in this case, a synagogue, that can get them out of the dysfunction their parents have passed on to them. In the local church, they can be around people who will love them and take care of them and get them out of that pit. And man, let me tell you what, this is why I'm so adamant about doing what we do for single moms down in the line heart wing. This is why I'm so adamant about our Mother's Day out. 
about getting kids down here, interacting with other kids. This is why I keep emphasizing over and over, we've got to do a better job of looking like Murfreesboro from all areas, especially socioeconomic, okay? Why? Because just from my own personal experience, when my mom and dad came out of the dysfunctional situation that I was born into, they became a part of a local church and my mom and dad watched other parents who were good parents, Christian parents, and my dad even admitted his own neediness by going to a neighbor. My mom admitted her neediness because she wasn't raised in a Christian home. My dad wasn't raised in a Christian home. They went to older adults who were raising their kids and they could look, those are good kids. I'd like for my kids to look like their kids someday. They went to these older adults and say, will you please help us? We're needy. Could you show us how to raise children in the way of the Lord so they can turn out to be good kids? And what was happening here in Jerusalem is the poor, the people from dysfunctional backgrounds, weren't allowed to come in and worship. And Jesus says, man, for many of these people, it's their only kid's chance if they are part of a church family. It's the teaching of the Word of God that enables people to not only worship, but to get out of the pit into which they were born. And so what Jesus is doing, he's conveying to those in power that they must remove the systemic cultural roadblocks of generational dysfunction. The things that our system does. We talk about the system. How does it produce? These are a part of the overarching 30,000-foot view. It's not about the choices that the quote-unquote victims are making. It's about our cultural society, what it does. And Jesus is trying to bust up this concrete. The reason the people had a difficult time there with the, and their family would have lived in shame with the water and the wine, it was because of their lack of education or just pride on their part. Their lack of proper health care. Kids can't learn well if they're constantly sick. This is something I spent a big chunk of my life on, is ensuring that children got proper nutrition. What I found with working in local politics is is that when I would visit our local schools, I'd look at the lunches that were there 10, 15 years ago in West Virginia, and it was just all warmed up brown food. And I knew that the kids that had more means were going home and having fruits and vegetables and their family were cooking in the right way. And all these poor kids were having was fried food all the time that's going to kill them that doesn't help them in their brain development. And so if we don't address proper nutrition, then those kids are constantly going to be a disadvantage when it comes to testing and learning. We see housing discrimination. There's something called redlining. Now, when I say redlining, Raise your hand if you know what redlining is. Raise your hand if you know what redlining is. Okay, leave them up, leave them up, raise your hand. Okay, now I say that, I'm doing this, but leave them up. About 10% of our white people know what redlining is. 100% of the African Americans in this room know what redlining is. That's significant, my friends. Why? Because redlining was systemic racism by which banks would not loan black people money so they could buy a house in black neighborhoods. The only way they were going to get out was to leave the neighborhoods where other black people lived. That was redlining. They literally would draw, banks would literally Draw on a map, we don't loan money for people to buy houses in these areas. And that systematically keeps races oppressed. Do y'all follow that? But about 90% of us in here didn't even know what it was. You know why? Because it didn't happen to your family. There are overarching, Jesus addressed, racial, gender-based, socioeconomic discrimination, which is the number one discrimination of all, because listen, if you got a lot of money, people don't care what color your skin is. And so when Nicodemus, next, after the cleansing of the temple, comes to Jesus and says, hey, 
maybe you're the guy who can lead us against the Romans. Maybe you're the guy who can institute the kingdom of God upon the earth. Maybe you're the guy who can lead us to do it. Notice what Jesus didn't start talking about with the head of the Pharisee political party. What Jesus did not do is go back to this list. He had one meeting with the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He had one meeting here with the President of the Senate. Are y'all tracking with me here? And the way he started with Nicodemus, and he says, what do we got to do about the kingdom of God here? Okay, you're from God. Instead of talking about all the systemic dysfunction, what Jesus says to Nicodemus is, if you want to see the kingdom of God principles here on the earth, the first thing y'all all got to do is get saved. Now you think about that. He probably was thinking, what political things can we do to address systemic, systematic dysfunction in our country? And Jesus says, here's the number one thing you can do here in Washington, D.C. It would be as if the, Joe Biden would come to me, Steve, what can we do to fix America? I would say to him what, what Jesus said to Nicodemus, all y'all up on Capitol Hill need to get saved. That's what needs to happen first. I don't need to talk about all these other things because if it's not coming from the right place, none of these things are going to change. If people are selfish in their hearts, those with power are going to continue to find a way to oppress. We outlawed, outlawed redlining. They just found a new way to do it because people's hearts haven't changed. Do you all follow that? We, we say all this, man, man, we got to vote to make America great again. We got to vote to make America great again. We got to take America back. Let me tell you what, most African Americans don't want to go back to 1965. America wasn't so great for them back then. We got to make America, take America back to Jesus again. Less people are attending church now, worshiping Jesus on Sunday mornings than at any time in our nation's history. We're not going to fix it at the ballot box. Joe Biden's not going to fix it. It's not going to come from Donald Trump. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? If there's going to be a change in our country, it's going to come from the pulpits of America and the people of God sharing with others. Y'all got to get saved. That's how we're going to change this generational curse that's upon people. And I'm just telling you, like, for my family, we could have sat around and we could have just played the role of victim our whole lives. And I could have complained I was born to a single mom. And I could have blamed I was born in poverty. But you know what? My local church taught me God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. And you can change the world. This little old boy that came home to Fayette County, West Virginia. And that's true. Listen, for all of you students who sit down here, you all got to understand this. You can make an impact on this world. All of you college students, it's not just go about going out and get a job that pays the most money to give you the nice house so you can drive that $80,000 truck. God has brought you to this room today and all these people surrounding you in here so you can make an impact on victimhood in our culture by releasing them from the chains of oppression that the devil and society has placed upon them. That's why you're here. This isn't some small thing that you've ended up in church today. This is a big, big deal. Now, speaking of somebody that's a big, big deal, he would hate that I'd say that. Brother Chip Dodd. Is, Chip, are you in this service? Chip's there in the back row. He's got one of the top five selling Christian books of all time called The Voices of the Heart. He's got a, a podcast right now that's online. It's really good. I, it would save a lot of my counseling problems if you would just le listen to his podcast every day, okay? Just listen to that. That would solve so many things. It's like taking your vitamins, okay? I asked him this week, I said, now, if I go to focus on people's spiritual well-being and how to get them out of victimhood, what are the major things that we have to address? And these are four of the things that he pointed out. I'm oversimplifying, but I, just for the sake of time. Number one, if someone's constantly stuck in having a victim mentality, this is what it looks like. They seek to blame others versus dealing with their own feelings, what's going on, on the inside. Instead of dealing with what I'm struggling with emotionally, I'm just going to blame everybody else for what I'm struggling with emotionally. The reason I'm all the time angry and bitter is because of the way my husband treats me. 
The reason I feel rejected is because people at school pick on me. The reason that I'm dealing with these feelings of inadequacies is because of the guy that broke up with me. The reason I can't play football is because my coach hates me. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? And as parents, we can even do that. Like, uh, the reason our race can't get ahead is because a man is pushing us down, right? It's just constant. Instead of dealing with your own stuff, you want to blame somebody else. Number two, it's a refusal to ask for help. And that's something I thank God for my own parents. Like, they weren't too proud to go to other families and say, we don't know how to raise a Christian son. Can y'all please help us? To admit your own neediness. Number three is now that it's everybody else's fault. You're not willing to ask for help. So therefore, to avoid the pain of interacting with others, you're going to isolate yourself. You're going to quit coming to church. Let me tell you what. I mean, that's why I hate this term church hurt. I just absolutely hurt it. Hate it because 1% of an organization can hurt you and say, I'm just never going to go back again. Don't cast the 1% of the people who go to church, don't cast that upon Jesus or the 99% who actually love you and care about you and your family. But a lot of times we can just isolate. I'm going to go in my corner. I'm just going to stay to myself. I won't get hurt anymore. And ultimately it ends to nobody understands what I've been through. Nobody understands me. I'm the only one that's had to suffer from a divorce. Nobody's had my situation. I'm the only one who got fired from a job. I'm the only one that's struggling with postpartum depression. I'm the only one that got cut from the team. I'm the only one that the teacher doesn't like me. I'm the only, so you're constantly saying, man, I'm just unique. Nobody understands my hurt. And so how does Jesus address this? I'm going to take you to where uh, Pastor McCarroll left off last week. And he already did all the context of the story, so I'm just going to highlight a few things about victimhood from this to lead into chapter 5. Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. There's two things going on here. One, different races don't talk to each other back then. Two, men don't talk to women. There's misogyny here and there's racism. Both things are going on. And so Jesus comes to her and says, hey, let's have a conversation. Do you mind giving me a drink of water? And her response is, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? It's both things. It's, it's gender-based discrimination she's expecting. She's expecting racial discrimination. And then it says here, for Jews have no, but notice here how it says here, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Just stating it like it's a fact. This is what I want you to understand. This is part of victimhood. Is there's, you know you're accepting your victimhood when you say, I can have no expectation of the cultural biases changing. I'm just stuck in this situation. It's never going to get any better. This can happen very often when you operate out of stereotypes. When you operate with, if you're raised, for example, if you're raised by a mother who tells you all the time, you can't trust men, men will hurt you, men will mistreat you, you can't, your father's no good, or here's, a, like there's always this, this man hate, you're hearing it from your friends at school or whatever, and then you marry the most wonderful man. And nine out of 10 things that he does, I mean, you're married the first 100 days, the first 99 days, he treats you like a queen. And then on day 100, he says, hey, do you mind going in there and making me a sandwich woman? He has a bad day. He doesn't word it well. And then automatically you revert back to, man, my mom told me right, men are pigs. On that day, you're right. And I'm going to just say, in general, men are pigs. I don't mind to say it. I thought a lot more women would say amen there. <laughs> Man, we're sinful. We're selfish. We're prideful. We got our issues. But every time that somebody of a different race or a different gender or a different political class or whatever when people are different and you try to reach across the aisle, you try to make friends, you try to reach someone who's poor, and then they do something that sometimes poor people do, and you're like, yeah, that's right, poor people are lazy, and you stereotype. Or, yeah, that's the way rich people are. Or, yeah, that's them white people. Ultimately, they, just, they don't even know. They're just ignorant. That's just what they do. And we automatically go back to those stereotypes. As, why? Because there's no expectation, like you see here, the cultural biases will ever change. 
Number two, I want you to see an example here. So he says, hey, where's your husband? She says, I have no husband. And he said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. Now, when he said this to the woman last week, y'all, Pastor Carol did a great job. She recognized, like, here it is. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, she probably feels like Jesus is stereotyping her because Samaritans were notorious for being sexually immoral. And so immediately she's saying, man, Jesus wants to address my sexual immorality. So what does she say next? Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you all say that Jerusalem is the place where we people ought to worship. Let me ask you a question. What does that question have to do with her shacking up with a guy? And so that's what? Nothing. What is she doing here? Jesus confronts her in her dysfunction, and her response is to do what? Deflect. Change the subject. Oh, oh, well, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about, hey, maybe the reason we're in the shape we're in is because of what you did. It's what we call, but what aboutism? Oh, yeah, well, you didn't take out the garbage, but what about the time in 1999 you did this to me? Like, we're just constantly deflect, 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 bringing up the past. That's what victims do when confronted with their own irresponsibility and stereotypes, they deflect. Now, it's not just the victims who act this way that cause a perpetuation of it. Just then the disciples come back and they marvel that Jesus was talking with a woman. Now, then think about that. These guys who were in power, the men over the women, in their mind, they are just perpetuating the misogyny. Now, what's he doing talking to that woman? You see, they, it was so culturally normal for them, they didn't even recognize what they were thinking was wrong. The Bible even says it, but they never even mentioned it to Jesus. They didn't even bring it out because it was just assumed. But then something happens in this woman's heart, and the Holy Spirit starts doing some renewal work. Watch what happens next. The woman leaves her water jar. She goes away into the town and says to the people, watch, watch, watch. Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Messiah? Now, first of all, did everybody in the town already know everything she'd already done? Did everybody already know she was shacking up with a guy on her sixth relationship? Did everybody already know that? Yes. But she didn't talk about it before because we kind of hide it. My mom might be watching this today, so, well, she will be watching this today. If she's not watching it live, mom, I apologize. We, I've already talked with her about this, but as you know, I was born to a single mom, got pregnant outside of wedlock. The way I found out was I was planning my parents' 20th wedding anniversary, and I was telling everybody in town to bring them to this surprise 20th anniversary party. The thing is, is everybody else that were my parents' friend and known them all these years knew that it wasn't going to be my parents' 20th anniversary. They had always lied to me about their wedding date so that I would believe that they got married before I was born. It was actually going to be their happy 19th anniversary. That's what it really was. So when I'm 19 years old and I'm telling everybody whatever, finally I had a pastor who loved me enough to come to me and say, Steve, um, this isn't going to be your parents' 20th anniversary. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. They got married in 1968, and this, uh, you need to ask your dad which anniversary this really is. And I went, and I'm like, Dad, what? And then he told me, and then I went to Mom. I'm like, what? And I say that for all the years, like, my parents allowed me to live a lie because They didn't want me to feel the shame that my mom felt for all those years. And then, listen, even after she told me that, out of respect for her, I didn't talk about it in a public forum because she still bore the shame of getting pregnant outside of wedlock in 1969. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? Just the power of cultural perpetual dysfunction 
and shaming people in every way. Man, I, I want to say this about the woman, how you know the Holy Spirit was at work in the woman at the well. Because finally, when she saw herself through the eyes of how Jesus saw her, you understand? The shame of the past went away. This takeaway of the day, number one, instead of reverting to past comforts, those who overcome their victimhood seek to use their story to change the stories of others. And I just wonder how many mamas my mama could have helped, how many more people my testimony could have helped if our family wouldn't have been ashamed of the dysfunction, but instead embrace it as a badge of honor. This is what we looked like before Christ transformed our family, but this is what Christ can do no matter what dysfunctional situation you were born in, no matter what decisions you've made in the past, when Jesus entered the room, everything can change. Amen? That's why you're here. So I want to share this with you, like embrace your past dysfunction. Don't run from it. Bring it on. This is your testimony that the devil is shaming you into hiding. If you've struggled with alcoholism, if you've committed an adulterous affair in the past, like the people walk around, I, I just got news for you. Here it comes. You ready for this? A lot of adulterers are in this room. I'm never going to point any of you out, but if y'all knew how much cheating went on, most of you wouldn't go here. There are people who have had abortions in this room, living under the shame. There are people who hide the divorce that they had when they were 19 years old. There are people who hide what they did when they got out of jail, a DUI. We are so wanting to present, worried about what other people think of us, we are detracting from the grace of God, demonstrating how it can transform someone who would submit their lives to Christ. You don't want to share anybody the greatness of your testimony because you want them to think more of you than they do the one who saved you from your sin. That's why you're hiding it. Embrace it. So now look what happens next. The Samaritans come to him, and they ask him to stay with them. And he stays there two days, and as a result, many more believe because of his word. But while they're there, guess who also has to be there? Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, which means they got to eat that Samaritan soul food, all right? And like, what are we going to eat? I don't want to eat this Samaritan food. I don't even want to go in the house of the Samaritan. This is what I want you to see, like to make an impact on cultural negativity. Everyone has to be willing to live in discomfort. These are the greatest missionaries of all who say, I will leave the comfortable situation that I'm in and go into something for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God that will make an impact to resolve the dysfunction and the lack of salvation that exists in our society. Now. Come to, I'm only going to do eight more verses with you. I come to John chapter 5. Another story of a victim. Jesus is coming in, and here's where everybody's going to worship. But there's this place over to the right, and we visit it when we go to Israel. It's still there to this day. It's called the Pools of Bethesda. Two huge pools. It's called the House of Mercy. It's kind of like a hospital for invalids. And they weren't allowed into the temple to worship. They weren't allowed there. Now, why weren't they allowed there? Because the Jews had misapplied this scripture from Leviticus 21. It says, speak to Aaron, saying, none of your offspring throughout their generations who has, has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. In other words, if you've got a crippled son of a priest, the son can't operate as a priest. Now, the reason he couldn't do this if he was crippled, it's like, can you work for the airline loading baggage if you've got a handicap, if you've got a disability? Do you follow what I'm saying? If you, they ask you up front, can you lift 50 pounds? You may want to all your life work for the airlines and load luggage in and out of a plane, but if you can't lift 50 pounds, we can't let you in that job. It's like they say, man, everybody loves grandpa, but he can't play shortstop anymore. Do y'all follow that? And so what it's saying here, it's not meant to be prejudiced against people with disabilities. 
Those who have blemish shall draw near. They can't come near a man blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long or a man has an injured foot or an injured hand. None of them are allowed in the temple to worship with everybody else. That's what they extrapolate, but it had nothing to do with their disability. It had everything to do with their ability to perform the sacrifices that priests were required to give. So Jesus trying to bust up that concrete, instead of going into the temple with all the healthy people, Instead of going to the temple with all the people with the money, when Jesus comes up, he goes into the house of mercy, Bethesda. And there's this feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, don't miss this before I go one. Don't miss this. The last time Jesus was in Jerusalem, they were out to kill him. Do you remember that? The leaders are like, if we get this guy in here again, he's going to be in big trouble. Did that stop Jesus from going to church? Did y'all get what I just said? Sometimes church people can do stupid, sinful things. I will even tell you this. Some of the worst people I have ever known in my life, some of the most judgmental people I've ever known in my life, some of the most, some of the least merciful people I've ever known in my life have been pastors. That doesn't keep me from calling pastors as much as I can and say, will you meet with me and try to pray again this month? The majority of the hurt in my life has come from Christian people. Hands down, not a close second. In the business dealings I've had, the people who have ripped me off the worst have people who have been people who have taken advantage of the verse saying Christians can't sue other Christians. So I know Steve follows the Bible. I'm not going to treat him fairly in this business situation. But listen, it didn't stop Jesus from going back to worship God at church. It's not going to stop me. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Don't go around here saying, oh, I was church, 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 church. Yeah, everybody's church, church. Why? Because people go to church. Sinners go to church. Everybody look all around this room. You see that? 300 people in the room right now. Guess how many sinners are in the room? 300. And if you're saying 299, you need to look in the mirror. You're number 300. It's filled with sinners. We're going to hurt each other. Didn't stop Jesus from coming. Now, he comes in. He's going to the pools of Bethesda. Okay, big place. In these lay a multitude of invalids. Blind, lame, and paralyzed. These are the people that aren't allowed to go to the temple. You come into Jerusalem, you bring in all your family members. While they're in the temple worshiping, you're going to drop them off here. But there's some people that stay here at this hospital all the time. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, there's a verse 4 that someone added later as a commentary. It's a last Sunday seminary discussion, but some of your Bibles have verse 4 in the footnotes. Okay, and originally I believe it was a footnote, uh, but somebody put it up in there to explain it, but it wasn't in the original text. I'm not even going to go into that verse because it's, it's man-made, okay? Um, so I'm going to be on to five. If you have more of a question about that, come last Sunday seminary. Now, there was a man that had been there as an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to the man, do you want to be healed? Now, the Bible explains what verse 4 explains is why is the man laying there? Because they had this superstitious belief that every once in a while an angel would come stir up the water, and if you were the first one to touch the water, you'd be healed. It's works-based salvation all over again. It wouldn't have been a thing God would have done. Whoever's the fastest to the water is the one that's going to be healed. When When the water starts bubbling, just touch it and you'll be healed. It's just total superstition. And so Jesus looks at this guy who's been laying there for years, and he asks him the question, you've been sick 38 years? Do you want to be be healed? Bro, like if I would say to you this morning, you've been sick 38 years. If I would say to you, man, hey, do you want to be healed right now? What would be your response? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, it's a a one-word answer, is it not? Listen, this is what is at the heart of what Jesus is asking. Do you want to get better? Or do you want to stay bitter? I'm in the, asking that question of all of you here this morning. If you've been hurt, if injustice has happened to you, if it's continuing to happen to you, whether it's systemic, it's so, a part of our culture, or if it's just your personal interaction with others, people have hurt you. Do you want to get better? Do you want your marriage to get better? 
Or do you want to stay bitter? That's what Jesus is asking the guy. To say it another way, do you want to get up or do you just want others to get blamed? And that's what I see all the time in marital counseling. People come in and this is what, do you want to have a healthy marriage? And the answer to that should be what? Do y'all want to have a healthy marriage? Yes. Do you want to have healthy relationships? Yes, that should be the answer, but it's rarely the answer I get. Usually when people come in for marital counseling, it's because they're both thinking, I want Steve to fix the person I'm married to. I want you to fix them. Rarely do they come in, sit down on the couch like, oh yeah, I really need to fix my issues because I'm not being a very good husband or one now. No, it's usually, well, this is what she's doing to me. This is what he's doing to me. And it's just going back and forth, blame shifting, deflecting. And Jesus is just asking a yes or no question. And I'm asking it to all y'all this morning. Whatever pain it is, whatever emotional distress you're in, however you've been victimized, here's the thing. Do you want to be better? Do you want to be healthy moving forward? This is how we know the guy's a victim. Watch what his answer is. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. The reason I'm still sick is because I don't have family to take care of me. I don't have any friends down here, Jesus. Did Jesus ask him about, did he have anybody to help him? Did Jesus ask him why he's been stuck there 38 years? All Jesus asked him was what? Do you want to get better? Do you want to get better? No matter what struggles you've got today, I'm not asking you, do you want your husband to get better? I'm not asking you, do you want your kids to get better? There's only one question Jesus is asking every person in this room here this morning. Do you want to be healthier than what you are right now? Do you want it for you? And so Jesus says to him, he realizes the guy misses the point. He says, get up, take your bed, and walk. And at this point, the man has a choice. Because here's the deal. If Jesus heals him and he's a healthy grown man, what's he going to have to go out and get the very next day? A J-O-B. You can't just sit around hanging on people's tax money anymore. If Jesus heals you, you're going to have to work. If Jesus heals you, you're going to have to get up and you're going to be expected to be in church every week. If Jesus heals you, you're going to get up and there's going to be expectations on you. Or would you rather just lie there and complain of the situation you're in? So let's take away the day number four, my last one for the day. Get up, get some help, and get moving. That's what Jesus' command was to the guy at the pool of Bethesda. That's what Jesus' command is here for you today. Get up from wherever you are. Get moving from whatever you're doing. Listen, spiritual, I'm not talking about physical. We can't always control that. But listen, spiritual paralyzation is a choice. You can get out of that, but it's probably going to take help. Now, I'm going to go back to what Chip said at the beginning. We see it all through these stories. You'll see it all through the Bible from now on. We see blame versus dealing with their own personal stuff going on. This guy's there, refusing to ask for help. He's blaming other people for helping him. Who are you asking for help? Jesus is there to help you. He's isolated. feels isolated. Nobody understands me. I've been here 38 years longer than anybody else. But this is what I oftentimes see. This is my point. Chip, could I add this to your list? Don't you usually see what victims do when they run into trouble, they get stressed. What do they do? They revert to their old behaviors. They go back to their old practices and they go back to their erroneous way. They run back to their old negative feelings. They run back to their dysfunction and start to live out the function. And that's why Jesus says to the man, he finds him. He's out running around. And Jesus says, see, you're well, like you're better. Sin no more. Now, if you tell somebody sin no more, what does it tell you they were doing before? They were sinning. He's letting you know the reason you were in the situation you were in was because of sin. You got to stop that. Otherwise, something worse may happen to you. And so once in a while, Jesus, watch this. Once in a while, you come to church. Once in a while, you have a life situation where Jesus says to you, Okay, 
I'm getting you out of this situation. You had a bad negative experience here. I know something bad happened to you, but I got to have you understand this. Now that you're in the process of the healing, listen, don't revert back to that old behavior. Don't go back to what you saw from your family. Otherwise, something worse may happen to you. And if you carry on that dysfunction, listen, it's not just going to happen to you. You're going to pass it on to your children. And I don't think there's any parent in here who wants to do that. I'm going to close with an illustration from a movie. Um, there's a Creed 1 and a Creed 2 and a Creed 3. How many of you have ever seen one of the Creed movies? Raise your hands. All right. It's got Michael Jordan, I think Junior in there is his name. And then there's this old Italian guy that most people under 30 don't even know who this old guy is. Okay? His name's Sylvester Sloan. Good. I'm glad y'all got a little cultural awareness here. Okay? But just so y'all know, Creed 1, 2, and 3 weren't the original movies. It's really about the story of Rocky, and there have been 33 of these movies. Okay? <laughs> there have been a lot of them. Now, I want to show, of all the Rocky movies they were, and I've watched every one of them multiple times, there's one of them that's the absolute worst of all the movies. Which one is? Oh, we've got group. Everybody's five. Five was the worst movie of them all. I'm not encouraging you to watch it. But my favorite scene from all 33 comes out of Rocky V. There's a story where he's in there and he's fighting the guy that he's trained, young guy named Tommy Gunn. He's a big old guy or whatever. And he's just whooping Rocky. And every Rocky story has the same story. It's the same story 33 times over. Rocky gets beat up. He's laying on the ground and it looks like it's over. Does he have the will to get back up, right? That's the story of every Rocky movie. He's been knocked down. Can he get back up? He's been beaten worse like Ivan Drago, just beating to death, you know? Like, he's been beat to death. And this is what I love, though. In Rocky V, his old trainer has, has died. And he's laying there on the ground, and all his friends from Philadelphia are saying, get up, get up, get up. And his wife's like, get up. Like, he has a dream where his wife's calling to him from the grave, get up, Rocky, get up, Rocky. Rocky doesn't get up when his wife calls him. And then all his friends, get up, Rocky, get up. His trainer, his boxing coach, get up, Rocky, get up. And, he's not from, and then, then his son's even, Dad, come on, you got to get up. And Rocky just laying there. And then Rocky has this dream of his dead trainer, Mickey, comes into the scene in black and white. And he says to Rocky, I didn't hear no bell. Get up, you, I can't say what he said in the movie, I'm going to edit it. Get up, you bum. And then he paused and he kind of smiles and he says, because Mickey loves you. And as soon as it says Mickey loves you, all the hearing you see Dun 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 Here comes Rocky and he whips the Tommy gun, he knocked him down, he punches Don King in the face, he lifts his arm, his son's giving him a hug or whatever. What was it that got Rocky up off to the ground? This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, It is the love of Christ that compels us. It's not our love for Christ that compels us. Jesus' love is what Jesus compels us. He picks us up off that mat. And that's what he's saying to all of you this morning. I didn't hear no bell. Get up, you bums, because Jesus loves you. Amen? Amen. <laughs>